Good afternoon and welcome to today's Lunch and Learn webinar for the Iowa Pediatric Mental Health Collaborative, Assessment and Intervention Strategies for Individuals at Risk for Psychosis, Introducing the Psychosis Risk Identification, Education and Research Peer Program at the University of Iowa, presented by Dr. Amanda McCleary. My name is Kathy Dixon and I'll be hosting the session today. I'll cover a few brief housekeeping announcements before we get started. The webinar will be recorded and made available for viewing on our YouTube channel, so please allow one to two business days for the recording to be made available. The link will be shared in the follow-up email after the session. Following the presentation, we'll have time for questions, so please um, use the Q&A feature in the webinar toolbar to submit your questions. In the chat section, I will attach instructions on how to claim continuing education credit. This information will also be sent in the follow-up email after the webinar. So without further delay, it's my pleasure to introduce our presenter today. Dr. Amanda McCleary received her PhD in clinical psychology from Kent State University and completed postdoctoral training in cognition, schizophrenia, and lifespan development, developmental psychopathology at UCLA. She joined the Department of Psychological and Brain Sciences at the University of Iowa in August of 2020. Her program of research has focused on cognitive and socio-emotional predictors of community functioning in people with schizophrenia and related conditions. She uses a multimodal approach, including performance-based and electrophysiological research methods. Dr. McCleary's research is currently supported by the K-23 Career Development Award from the National Institute of Mental Health, a Pathways Research Award from al and a visionary grant from the American Psychological Foundation. In her spare time, she enjoys hanging out with her dogs, road trips with her dogs, paddling around a kayak with her dogs, and camping with her dogs, as well as puttering about on a motorcycle, sadly without the dogs. So with that, I will turn it over to you, Dr. McCleary, and thank you for being here today. Thank you so much, Kathy, and thank you to uh, Dr. Stevens for inviting me to, to speak with everyone today. I'm really excited to be here. Um, so before I jump in, just uh, want to provide uh, my disclosures. Uh, so I have received payment for clinical assessment services from Medivante Prophase uh, and research funding for projects that are unrelated to this presentation from the Canadian Institutes of Health Research, NIMH, the Brain and Behavior Research Foundation, Alkermes, and the American Psychological Foundation. So I am a clinical psychologist. Uh, my area of research focuses on predictors of functional outcome across the lifespan in people with schizophrenia spectrum conditions. I joined the UIOA psychology faculty pretty recently in August 2020, and here I uh, direct an experimental psychopathology lab called MAPLE, and I co-direct a new clinical research service called PEER, and that's uh, what I'm going to be telling you about today. Uh, before jumping in, though, I just want to acknowledge the team effort that goes into the PEER program. So I co-direct PEER with Dr. Bengi Baran. She is a neuroscientist and a sleep researcher who is also in the psychology department here. She joined at the same time that I did, and she directs the NAP lab. We both came to Iowa from early psychosis programs. Uh, Bengi was at uh, Mass General and I was at UCLA. And we're both just really, really happy that we were able to collaborate and establish an early psychosis program here at Iowa. So the aim for my presentation today is to provide a broad overview of early detection and intervention strategies for psychotic illness. I'm going to start out by providing a bit of a historical context for shifts in the field regarding how we think about schizophrenia and the rationale for early intervention. Then I'm going to talk about evidence-based treatment models for early uh, psychosis or recent onset psychosis that have been rolled out across the United States. And then finally, I'll talk about strategies that aim to intervene even earlier in the illness process and the program that we've launched here at Iowa called PEER. In terms of uh, learning objectives for the presentation, the main takeaways are going to be, one, a summary of the current research literature surrounding risk factors for psychosis and outcomes for those who are at risk. I'll also identify best practices surrounding assessment and intervention for this clinical population. 
And then finally, you can learn how to incorporate a brief screening measure into your clinical practice and also learn how to refer uh, one of your clients or patients for further evaluation. Um, as Kathy mentioned, please uh, put uh, questions in the QA and in the chat, and I will uh, try to pause periodically uh, for questions. So psychotic illness is characterized by a constellation of symptoms, including positive symptoms like delusions and hallucinations, disorganization of thought, speech, and behavior, and negative symptoms like avolition and anhedonia. Impaired cognitive performance is also associated with psychosis, as is marked disability across a variety of domains, including impairments in occupational or academic functioning, social relationships, and uh, independent living. And although we tend to think of psychotic illnesses as something that is a condition of adulthood, we know that the processes that underlie psychosis unfold over an extended time frame, and they have their origins much earlier in life. With regard to how these different symptom domains behave over time, Positive symptoms indicated here in the green line, so these are delusions, hallucinations, they tend to wax and wane in terms of their severity, typically crossing the threshold to confer disability sometime in late adolescence or early adulthood. There are individual differences regarding the degree of remission or relief from these symptoms between episodes. So some people will have pretty minimal symptoms between episodes, uh, they will uh, essentially recover. Others will have subthreshold, milder versions of these symptoms pretty, pretty continuously in between episodes. And others will have symptoms that remain at a high level and are disabling and relatively continuous. In contrast, negative symptoms, so this is the, the sort of reddish colored line, which includes low motivation and anhedonia, and cognitive impairments represented by the blue line tend to have a much more stable course and are much more strongly associated with disability. Over the last 30 years, the collective work of a number of research groups, including the pioneering longitudinal work by Nancy Andreasen here at Iowa, have led to a better understanding of schizophrenia spectrum conditions and a shift in how they're conceptualized. The first major shift was the increasing recognition of the cognitive impact of schizophrenia. This led to the reconceptualization of schizophrenia as a cognitive disorder. The second major shift in the field is the reconceptualization of schizophrenia as a neurodevelopmental disorder. So although, as I mentioned a moment ago, the dramatic positive symptoms tend to emerge in late adolescence or early adulthood, the processes that underlie the illness unfold across development. Finally, the emergence of the recovery model in the 1990s, which served to broaden treatment to include individualized goals and improving quality of life, as opposed to an exclusive focus on managing clinical symptoms, had a huge impact on the development of early detection and intervention programs. So let's turn first to cognition. So cognitive impairment isn't included in the DSM-5 criteria for psychotic illnesses, but it is a core feature of schizophrenia and related conditions. And it's very common, impacting an estimated 80% of people with the diagnosis. Even when cognitive performance falls within normal limits or better, it's been argued that nearly all individuals with schizophrenia perform at levels that fall below expectations. And evidence for this notion comes from studies of twins who are discordant for schizophrenia and are discordant in terms of their cognitive performance, from studies that compare actual to expected performance based on the person's level of intellectual functioning prior to the onset of their illness, and from studies of people who have a diagnosis of schizophrenia, but also have intellectual abilities in the superior range. To illustrate what I mean, in this figure, I have a variety of cognitive domains plotted along the x-axis, and I've set the performance of a normative sample of adults without mental illness to the zero line. As a group, people with chronic phase schizophrenia, indicated here in black, typically perform about one to two standard deviations below the normative sample across cognitive domains. 
I have the profile for a large sample of people with recent onset schizophrenia in yellow. So these are folks who are within the first two years since illness onset. So they're pretty early in the illness course. And what you can see here is that the profile of cognitive performance is pretty similar in this group to what we observe in the chronic phase of schizophrenia. So the takeaway here is that cognitive performance is impaired in the illness, and these impairments are present early in the illness at onset, and perhaps even before. So in summary, the performance pattern that we tend to see in schizophrenia is a diffuse pattern that impacts a variety of cognitive domains from very sort of lower order perceptual processing, so very basic processes, up through higher order executive functions. And these impairments are uh, present early in the illness course. The magnitude of the effects are fairly large across domains. Notably, cognitive performance doesn't appear to be substantially impacted by clinical factors. So the severity of uh, positive symptoms of psychosis or the amount of time the person has been suffering with schizophrenia or the duration of their illness. Nor is performance attributable to the effect of medications. And I say this because cognitive impairment is also consistently reported in studies of people who were not taking antipsychotic medications at the time of cognitive testing and also uh, is present among those who have never taken antipsychotic medications during their illness, so antipsychotic naive participants. The relationship between cognition and community functioning is well established in the literature. The strength of the association is small to moderate for individual cognitive domains, and it's a little stronger when we look at overall co uh, cognitive composite scores. And these uh, findings are pretty robust. Um, and I say that in that the, the findings have been replicated by research groups around the globe using a variety of different cognitive tests and also with diverse patient samples. This relationship between cognition and functioning is evident early in the illness course and among those who are at risk for schizophrenia. And longitudinal studies demonstrate that the relationship holds up over time with cognitive impairment predicting later community functioning over follow-up periods ranging from six months to four years. So taken together, this work suggests that cognition is a potential treatment target to improve functional recovery in people with schizophrenia. So one thing that I, I wanna point out here is that I'm speaking very broadly um, about group differences. So comparing the average performance of a group of people with schizophrenia to the average performance of a group of people without schizophrenia or uh, with those with a, a different psychiatric condition. But it's important to keep in mind that there's a lot of variability in performance among members of each group and that proportions of the distributions of cognitive scores are going to overlap with each other across groups. Again, referring to group differences, um, we tend to see less cognitive impairment in affective psychoses like bipolar disorder. But again, there's a lot of variability within groups. So this leads us to the second major shift in the field, reframing schizophrenia as a neurodevelopmental disorder. So schizophrenia is typically diagnosed in late adolescence or early adulthood um, at the onset of frank psychotic symptoms. And these are the symptoms that typically necessitate clinical intervention. Oftentimes it's a, a clinical emergency at that point. However, oftentimes there were early warning signs of psychosis that emerged in the months or years preceding that. In addition, there are also subtle disturbances that are apparent in early childhood with regards to uh, cognitive, motor, and social development. So these, uh, these disturbances appear many, many years before there is any hint of psychosis. And this suggests that the processes associated with schizophrenia start really early in life and they unfold slowly across development. Shifting now to the recovery model for psychosis and the implications for treatment and early intervention. For a long time, there was a prevailing and erroneous notion that people with severe mental illness uh, couldn't benefit from psychosocial interventions like psychotherapy. And treatment efforts were generally focused on pharmacotherapy to manage psychotic symptoms and striving for clinical remission and clinical management. 
The recovery model took hold in the 1990s and widened the focus to include the individual's goals and values. So what is important to the individual and which roles provide meaning to them and what kind of a life do they wanna live? This means that the patient has uh, now becomes an active participant in their treatment. They are part of a collaborative team and they contribute to treatment planning and goal setting. This type of model lends itself really well to psychosocial interventions that are geared towards skill development to facilitate the patient moving forward uh, towards their goals regarding work or school, uh, their interpersonal relationships and integration into their community. Maybe moving them towards goals surrounding independence, improving well-being, and improving quality of life. And these interventions support engagement in activities that are enriching to the individual. The recovery model is central to early intervention treatment programs that I'm going to be talking about today. In terms of the evidence-based uh, evidence based interventions for psychosis, uh, we know that for many people, antipsychotic medications can provide relief from positive symptoms of psychosis. However, advances in pharmacological interventions for negative symptoms and for cognitive impairments has been pretty disappointing so far. With regards to managing positive symptoms, uh, we are seeing uh, increasing adoption of long-acting injectable forms of antipsychotic medications, and also that these uh, long-acting injectables are being adopted earlier in the illness course. So there used to be sort of uh, the, the, the notion that long-acting injectables were sort of the last resort, but really what we've, what we've learned is that long-acting injectables can facilitate adherence to a medication regimen, they can help prevent clinical relapse, and there's also some growing evidence for potential neuroprotective effect of, of these medications as opposed to the oral form, uh, potentially related to uh, improved adherence. Other interventions that are empirically supported include psychoeducation and il illness management interventions. So these are individualized, um, helping the, the person to identify, you know, what are, what are my early warning signs of a relapse? What's my action plan? Who is part of my support network? What factors contribute to my well being? What factors maybe get in the way of my well being? And so on. Family interventions, uh, these focus on uh, improving communication and relationships between family members, managing crises, including sort of the initial uh, psychotic break and the fallout from that. Uh, establishing and maintaining appropriate boundaries and supporting recovery and increased independence as, uh, as their loved one recovers. Supported work and education uh, interventions are also evidence-based. Um, one such intervention is called individualized placement and support. Uh, this is a model where the individual is paired with a specialized team member who will assist with job searches for competitive employment, uh, provides support and helps prepare for interviews, helps to interface with supervisors and support job retention, and will also assist uh, the individual to navigate requests for appropriate accommodations. And this intervention has been modified to, uh, for, uh, for younger people with psychosis, so recent onset psychosis, as well as those who are at risk for psychosis in the form of uh, uh, supported education programs. Cognitive behavioral interventions have also received empirical support, including cognitive behavioral social skills training, CBT for psychosis, and there's emerging evidence to support interventions like acceptance and commitment therapy and motivational interviewing. Cognitive re rehabilitation involves repeated practice of cognitive tasks um, in an effort to improve cognitive skills. Um, so things like attention, perceptual discrimination thresholds, um, increasing working memory capacity and problem solving abilities. And also there are interventions targeting social cues and social cognition. These programs might be computerized or they might use paper and pencil tests um, and they may be administered individually or in groups. Typically, uh, we also include what's called a bridging component. Uh, so this includes a group discussion of how to link the skills learned in the cognitive training lab to everyday life. And the idea here is to try to get these skills to generalize outside of the lab. 
The website that I have linked here is uh, a link to the Division 12 of the American Psychological Association website that outlines uh, these interventions and a number of other empirically supported interventions for psychosis for anyone who's interested. So why is early intervention critical for psychotic illness? Uh, the main idea here is that the earlier that we intervene, the greater the impact will have on clinical and functional trajectories. So we can try to minimize the, the divergence in trajectories from, from their peers. We can enhance recovery and reduce disability. And also we can try to treat symptoms earlier on when they're less severe and maybe be able to avert psychiatric crises. And indeed, the literature supports the notion that early intervention is, uh, is helpful. A recent meta-analysis of 10 trials from early psychosis programs around the world supported better outcomes, uh, including sustained engagement in treatment versus early dis discontinuation. Uh, early intervention is associated with a lower risk of psychiatric rehospitalization, lower relapse rates, better symptom improvement, and better overall functioning and improved quality of life. These early intervention programs uh, were team-based and they offered comprehensive services, including pharmacotherapy and a family psychoeducation group. Some of these interventions also included psychosocial interventions like CBT, some kind of vocational or supported education program, social skills training, and a crisis response team to, uh, to really uh, help people stay engaged even when, um, when their symptoms were exacerbated. Several of these treatment components were combined together and recently tested in a large multi-site randomized trial from NIMH called the RAISE study. Here, the aim was to test the effectiveness of a coordinated specialty care program for early, early course psychosis, and also to inform implementation of this type of program in community mental health center uh, settings across the US. So the RAISE uh, coordinated specialty care program was called Navigate. Um, it's an intensive wraparound program uh, that's provided by a team of specialists, uh, but it, is, it takes place in a community mental health care uh, setting. And the interventions are developmentally appropriate for late adolescence and early adulthood when psychosis emerges. The treatment program was offered for at least two years, and then the patient participants were transitioned to typical treatment as usual in their community. The Navigate team includes a physician or nurse uh, practitioner uh, for uh, personalized medication management, a supported education um, or employment worker, a therapist, a family worker, and a case manager. The components of treatment are personalized medication management. So this involves uh, working with the prescribing physician or nurse practitioner and the patient to collaboratively track labs, symptoms, and adherence to the medication regimen. Also to track side effects and then to make shared decisions about pharmacotherapy that are based on uh, evidence-based prescribing practices. The researchers also used a computerized platform called Compass uh, that would uh, use an algorithm to provide individualized medication and dosing recommendations based on the information collected from the monthly prescriber visits. A general guide uh, for the personalized medication management was to start low and go slow with antipsychotic medication dosing titration and to aim for the lowest effective dose. Another aim was to reduce polypharmacy unless it was indicated and to carefully monitor for side effects. Finally, if, uh, the prescribers were encouraged to consider long acting injectables if the patient was a good candidate. In addition, Navigate included supported education and employment, individualized resiliency training. Um, this includes uh, psychoeducation about the illness and management and relapse prevention strategies, how to manage positive and negative symptoms of their illness, uh, setting goals and skills training to develop emotion regulation, stress management, um, healthy behaviors and interpersonal skills. And then finally, family um, psychoeducation and support and case management were also key, component, key components of Navigate. 
So the trial was conducted at community mental health centers, not at academic medical centers, um, and 34 clinics were inc included across 21 sites. The clinics were randomly assigned to provide the Navigate coordinated specialty care program or to provide treatment as usual. So this would be sort of routine medication management, case management, and so on. They had uh, over 400 uh, patient participants enrolled. Um, they were in their early 20s, uh, generally living with family and um, within the first six months of antipsychotic treatment and had had at least one prior episode of psychosis. So these were folks who were very early on in the illness course. One thing that I want to point out here and we'll unpack a little bit later is the amount of time that individuals at community mental health centers were suffering with psychosis before receiving adequate treatment. Uh, so this is referred to as the duration of untreated psychosis or DUP in the literature. The median DUP for the, the RAISE sample was about a year and a half, um, and the majority of participants had a DUP of at least six months. So just sort of let that sit with you for a moment. At least six months and typically closer to a year and a half of uh, full-blown psychotic symptoms before receiving appropriate treatment. And think about all the things that can happen during that interval to a young person. Um, so perhaps, you know, the symptoms led to them dropping out of school or leaving work, uh, you know, burning relationships, perhaps losing their housing and interactions with the legal system. As I mentioned a moment ago, the, the treatment in uh, the RAISE study was offered for at least two years. So the RAISE researchers looked at a few different outcomes of two-year follow-up. They found that overall inpatient admissions uh, didn't differ between the two treatments. So it was about 35% in both groups. Um, they did find that coordinated specialty care with Navigate was very acceptable to, to patients and there was really good engagement in services relative to treatment as usual. The uh, coordinated specialty care patients were significantly more likely to report that they had received key services and remained in treatment significantly longer compared to treatment as usual, so 23 months versus 17 months. Regarding clinical outcomes, the Navigate uh, coordinated specialty care yielded greater improvement in psychiatric symptoms and improved quality of life, and these effects were moderated by duration of untreated psychosis. So the Navigate coordinated specialty care participant, or the Navigate coordinated specialty care intervention had a larger impact when the duration of untreated psychosis was briefer. With regards to service utilization and medication outcomes, the Navigate uh, group had significantly more medication visits. Um, these were offered monthly in the program, um, as opposed to, I think, what, what's typical for treatment as usual would be about every three months or so. Navigate was also associated with less polypharmacy and lower overall side effect burden. The cost of Navigate um, was uh, a little higher for outpatient services and medication costs. Um, and this reflects better engagement with services and also the use of on patent oral medications and long acting injectables in the Navigate group. So these are more expensive medications. However, the costs were associated with an increased quality of life. Navigate is currently being rolled out across the United States. And here in Iowa, there are at least four programs that are now up and running. Um, they were funded by a mental health block grant um, that was earmarked to impl implement Navigate. Um, there is the, the first program in Cedar Rapids, Restore in Des Moines, Harmony in Sioux City, and Renew in Mason City. So these are programs for, uh, you know, adolescents and young adults who are experiencing their initial uh, psychotic episode. Um, and they offer comprehensive uh, coordinated specialty care that's, that's consistent with the Navigate model uh, through these programs. So the RAISE project really underscores the importance of addressing treatment delays, um, even at what we would 
uh, call an early intervention stage. So recall that the, the median duration of psychosis, untreated psychosis in RAISE was about 74 weeks. We don't have, we don't have a current estimate for the, for the duration of untreated psychosis in Iowa right now, but um, a paper from Nancy Andreasen's early psychosis program here at Iowa uh, that was published back in 2003 also noted a mean duration of untreated psychosis of 74 weeks. So DUP is, is a real problem. And it really makes a difference for outcomes. So here on this figure, I have um, a, um, sorry, on the slide, I have a figure from a recent meta-analysis of, uh, it was included 129 studies and over 25,000 patient participants with schizophrenia. And the way to interpret the figure is that all of the effect sizes that are falling uh, to the left of this line here indicate that a longer duration of untreated psychosis is associated with a poorer outcome. And on this side of the line is the opposite. So longer duration of untreated psychosis is associated with a better outcome. And any, any of the effect sizes that are sort of hovering on the, the zero line um, are not significant. So what you can see here is that longer duration of untreated psychosis is associated with a variety of poor outcomes, um, including um, you know, higher uh, symptom burden, poorer community functioning, social functioning, and vocational functioning, and a lower overall quality of life. So what are the, the factors that contribute to long duration of untreated psychosis and what gets in the way of accessing treatment? Um, one is limited awareness of what early psychotic symptoms look like and how they're treated um, among the general public and also among others who may encounter young people early in the illness course as part of their uh, professional activities. So uh, teachers, um, uh, you know, uh, primary care providers, um, school counselors and so on. Um, patients and families might have a tendency to dismiss uh, early warning sign symptoms as reflecting problems with mood or substances. And indeed, a lot of the early warning sign symptoms that we're going to talk about in a few moments are, they're, they're sort of diffuse. They, they, uh, look, they look like they could be um, sort of indicative of any number of uh, psychological conditions. So they're hard to recognize. Also professionals operating outside of mental, the mental health field may not pick up on subtle symptoms during routine office visits unless they're specifically asking about it. So how can we remedy this? Um, there is some evidence that information campaigns can help reduce the duration of untreated psychosis. Um, and this is a, a pretty low burden intervention, um, public health informed intervention. Um, and evidence for this comes from a series of, a series of studies from Norway. Um, they offered information campaigns for professionals and for the general public about how to recognize the symptoms of psychosis and how to get access to treatment. And what they found was uh, that this information campaign was associated with a significant reduction in the duration of untreated psychosis compared to a similar region that did not receive the information campaign. Uh, in Norway, the duration of untreated psychosis is, is much lower than, uh, than in North America. So their sort of average is 16 weeks and it was reduced down to five weeks. Notably, um, in a sort of a second study of the series, the reduction in duration of untreated psychosis went away when the information campaign was discontinued. So it went back up to 16 weeks. And this was despite the availability of early psychosis treatment programs in the region. So it's really about getting the word out about how to recognize these symptoms. Another contributing factor to, um, to long durations of untreated psychosis is that the pathway to mental health care can be really complicated and the outcome of contacts along the way can uh, determine um, to some extent how much uh, individuals and their families want to uh, continue making attempts to get help. So what we know from, from research is that patients and families often make several attempts to get help before they receive a successful referral. And unfortunately, along the way, they may have negative interactions with, uh, with law enforcement or emergency services. Um, although these contacts with law enforcement and emergency services may also be the contact that gets the person connected with mental health treatment ultimately. 
Other factors that contribute to duration of untreated psychosis is just the general availability of mental health services in the community. Um, so there's a limited number of providers. Oftentimes there's long wait times. Um, one question that, that we have is, you know, can early uh, intervention and detection programs help to reduce the duration of untreated psychosis? And my response to that is that while early psychosis programs represent a really huge leap forward in terms of the standard of care, it's a bit of a misnomer to call these programs early intervention. Um, at best, it's on-time intervention. And what we learned from RAISE is that more typically, intervention is about 74 weeks late on average. And it may be, the, the treatment may be initiated in the context of a full-blown psychiatric emergency. So really for early intervention, we need to detect psychosis before it erupts. So during the prodromal phase of the illness and offer interventions before the person experiences a mental health crisis. So you may be asking, you know, what do prodromal symptoms look like? Well, these, uh, many of them look like milder versions of uh, classic psychotic symptoms. And so we would refer to these as attenuated positive symptoms. So this would be, you know, perceptual aberrations and illusions or distortions versus a hallucination or unusual thoughts and magical thinking or overvalued ideas versus a delusion or suspiciousness versus paranoia. The main idea here is that the person retains some level of insight into their symptoms. The symptoms may be compelling and they may be preoccupying and distressing, but there is still some recognition that these experiences may not be reality-based or may not be attributable to some kind of external source. Other types of symptoms um, include negative symptoms, so low motivation and drive, a diminished expression of emotion, and social withdrawal. Disorganized symptoms as well that you may see during the prodromal phase include vague or odd speech, uh, circumstantial speech, so sort of kind of a, uh, rambling or meandering before getting to the point, having trouble organizing thoughts, and odd or eccentric behaviors. Other types of symptoms are much less specific to psychosis. So this includes changes in mood, cognition, social behavior, and sleep. We generally also see a decline in functioning. So this may uh, be reflected in terms of work or school performance, uh, perhaps withdrawing from uh, relationships, and also changes in uh, self-care and hygiene. The DSM-5 now has a diagnostic category to capture this constellation of symptoms. It's called the attenuated psychosis syndrome, and you can find it under the other specified psychotic disorder section. However, one thing that we wanna be really careful about is that we don't wanna pathologize normative experiences or experiences that are really not associated with any kind of distress or impairment. So psychotic-like experiences are, are actually much more common uh, in the general population than you might think, um, especially among adolescents. And they are not always experienced as something that's distressing or they don't interfere with the person's life. However, I wanna sort of emphasize here that individuals who are in the prodromal phase of uh, psychotic illness are help-seeking. So they are experiencing distress and a decline in their functioning and their loved ones are quite concerned. There's a, a general sense that something's not quite right. Uh, they report that they feel like they can't trust their own mind. They can't trust their perceptions. They can't trust their memory. Um, they may be becoming preoccupied with ideas that are really bothersome to them. And they're withdrawing from friends and family and having difficulty at school. One thing to, to sort of point out here is just some semantics. So, uh, you know, we, uh, refer to, to this constellation of symptoms as representing the prodromal phase of psychosis, but prodrome is really a retrospective concept. Somebody needs to develop an illness before we can say that there was a prodromal period. Um, what we know from, from uh, research with this clinical population is that the vast majority of people who have been identified as, uh, as prodromal do not actually go on to develop psychotic illness. 
And so the preferred term right now is, is clinical high risk or CHR um, to, to capture this at-risk mental state. So the idea here is that this is sort of capturing the spirit of the prodromal state that uh, precedes the onset of psychosis, but it also acknowledges the limitation of our prediction methods. So next I wanna move on just to our first learning objective here, which is about evidence-based assessment for clinical high risk. So how do we assess for these experiences and symptoms? Well, we use uh, well-validated self-report screening measures, semi-structured uh, clinical interviews, and also cognitive tests. The PQB is a brief screening measure that you can actually, today, you can start incorporating this into your clinical practice as a way to uh, screen for psychotic life experiences and to start a conversation with someone that you're concerned about. So if you're working with a young person that you suspect something may be going on, the PQB may be a way to, uh, to, get, uh, to get a conversation going. This measure includes 21 items that are yes, no, um, that assess the presence of psychotic-like experiences uh, within the last month. And if the person indicates that, the, that this experience has been present in the last month, then they uh, indicate how distressing or impairing um, the experience has been for them. And sorry, my thing froze, here we go. So there's a total score, um, which is just the sum of yes and no items ranging from zero to 21. And then the, dis the distress score uh, ranges from zero to 105. Uh, the recommended score for further assessment, this is, this is in sort of research settings, is a distress score of six or greater. And this um, is associated with, with uh, pretty good sensitivity and specificity um, uh, for the clinical high risk syndrome um, uh, uh, classification based on a structured interview. Um, the, the measure has very good psychometric properties um, and is correlated with interview-based measures of, of clinical high risk. Um, but one thing that's important for you to know is that the PQB does not distinguish clinical high risk or sub-threshold symptoms from full-blown psychos uh, psychosis. This is just a broad screening measure for psychotic-like experiences. For clinic use, um, my suggestion would be just to, uh, to use this a little bit more qualitatively and just get a sense of what the person's experiences are and how, um, how they're impacting them. And this could start a conversation in terms of uh, maybe um, thinking about referrals for additional um, assessment or incorporating this information into your treatment plan. To diagnose the clinical high-risk syndrome, we use a structured clinical interview called the SIPS, um, and we uh, apply scoring criteria called the SOPS. This is the gold standard assessment of the clinical high-risk syndrome that we use in North America, and it's appropriate for use for individuals age 12 and up. Um, the measure assesses all of the symptoms that I mentioned earlier um, with attenuated positive symptoms, negative symptoms, disorganized symptoms, and then also general psychopathology symptoms. The clinician will consider the frequency, severity, and the onset or chronicity of these various symptoms. Um, and we'll combine this information to, uh, to arrive at a classification. Um, they will sort of take into account whether the symptoms seem to be worsening or improving, and if they are recent onset versus longstanding and stable. As opposed to the PQB, the SIPS does distinguish um, uh, clinical high risk from frank psychosis. Um, this is a measure that's really suitable for repeat assessments and continued monitoring of symptoms and has very good psychometric properties. If anyone in the audience is interested to learn how to administer and score the SIPs, um, I encourage you to get in contact with me um, as new trainees are onboarded into, uh, into our program. We arrange for training and certification with uh, Dr. Barbara Walsh from the Yale Prime Clinic. And uh, we do this uh, via uh, a Zoom training session and we'd be happy to include you. 
To assess cognition, one of the measures that we use in our research is the matrix consensus cognitive battery. Um, this is not a diagnostic battery, but we use it to cognitively characterize uh, uh, individuals with psychotic spectrum uh, illness, including those at clinical high risk. This test battery has been recommended by the NIMH and the FDA as a cognitive endpoint in clinical trials uh, that include people with schizophrenia. And it's been adopted pretty widely outside of clinical trials uh, in an effort to harmonize measures across research centers. In terms of uh, our next learning objective, I want to talk a little bit about risk factors and predictors of outcomes for those who are at risk for psychosis. So risk factors for psychosis include a variety of genetic factors. Um, rather than a single schizophrenia gene that was posited many years ago, uh, genome-wide association studies demonstrate that many, many, many individual genes make small contributions uh, to risk for psychosis. There are, however, some notable exceptions. Um, so for example, compared to a base rate of about 3% in the general population who develop psychosis, about 10% of people with 22Q11 Q11 deletion syndrome or velofacial cardio syndrome um, experience psychosis. And many more uh, beyond that 10% will also exhibit subthreshold psychotic like experiences. Other risk factors include having a family history of psychosis, uh, particularly among first degree relatives. Epidemiological studies indicate a host of pre and perinatal factors that are associated with increased risk, including maternal stress, maternal infection, and obstetric complications. And then finally, social and environmental factors that contribute to risk include adverse childhood experiences, trauma, bullying, migration, discrimination, growing up in an urban setting, for example. In addition, early exposure to cannabis and regular use of cannabis place some individuals at heightened risk, uh, perhaps due to an interaction with particular risk genes. Finally, family communication style um, that is marked by high levels of expressed emotion, including high levels of criticalness and hostility, and high levels of emotional overinvolvement are associated with poorer outcomes among those who have established psychotic illness and among those who are at risk for psychosis. In terms of predictors for conversion to psychosis among those who are at risk, the bulk of the research has focused on clinical symptoms, um, such as attenuated delusions and hallucinations in particular, cognitive performance, um, level of functioning, and environmental stressors, such as adverse childhood experiences, trauma, and cannabis. And as the number of CHR programs grow, there's more work being done to identify biomarkers and genetic factors and to use data-driven computational methods to try to identify factors from very large combined data sets. From one of the large consortiums um, of uh, clinical high-risk studies, um, there has been development of a, of a risk calculator um, to sort of uh, try to identify who may be more likely to develop uh, psychotic illness. Um, this is an empirically based risk calculator um, that includes measures that can be collected in the clinic. So, um, you know, based on symptom ratings, family history, and level of functioning, they found a very high sensitivity, but relatively low specificity. So there's uh, lots of true, uh, lots of false positives um, for detecting those at risk for conversion. And just one thing for us all to think about is the potential consequences of a false positive for the individual and their family. So being identified as being at risk for psychosis when that's not actually the case. So our goal is to try to improve prediction models through research and also to identify factors that help protect or confer resiliency as well. So we have measures for screening for psychotic-like experiences and um, for diagnosing the clinical high-risk uh, syndrome and evaluating cognitive performance. When we think about what happens to individuals who have been identified as being at risk over time, the transition rates from the clinical high-risk state to established psychosis 
varies quite a bit across studies, but data from meta-analytic reviews and large multi-site studies indicate that we can expect a conversion rate of about 20 to 30% over five-year follow-up. So this is much higher than the risk for psychosis in the general population, which hovers around one to 3%, but also we need to recognize that the vast majority of people identified as being at risk don't convert. So what happens to the non-converters? Well, about one third of the non-converters will remit, meaning that they no longer meet clinical high-risk criteria. The remaining individuals will have persistent psychotic-like experiences, so they'll have uh, symptoms that don't reach threshold for frank psychosis, but the symptoms are enduring and may impact functioning to some degree. Other individuals will develop other forms of psychopathology, including mood or anxiety disorders. And I would argue that it's really informative for us to study the non-converters because this can help us to identify potential protective factors that can inform our treatments. Speaking of protective factors, this is just a really understudied topic. Um, so these are factors that may uh, help to avert negative clinical outcomes or factors that contribute to positive symptoms and successful adaptation. Um, this is a real gap in the literature. Um, I worked with uh, some colleagues to try to um, identify some potential modifiable factors based on um, you know, factors that seem to contribute to positive outcomes or increased well-being among those with psychotic illness and factors that might distinguish clinical high-risk converters from non-converters. The, the sort of upshot here is that much more work is needed, um, but there is a signal for certain biological factors like sleep and physical activity and sort of having a flexible autonomic nervous system that can respond to environmental demands psychological factors like being uh, having a tendency to engage in adaptive coping strategies, uh, high levels of self-esteem, being resistant to stigma. Uh, social factors like having high levels of social support and high quality relationships. And then features of the built-in natural environment. There's less, uh, the, the literature here is somewhat sparse, but there's a signal for things like neighborhood walkability and high quality housing as being protective factors. And in the natural environment, exposure to green and blue spaces, both currently and during early development, is having a protective effect for mental health and well being. In terms of preventing or delaying psychosis, um, about 70% of those identified as clinical high risk do not develop psychosis. So we want to consider the potential impact of exposure to interventions with negative side effects uh, compared to the potential benefits. The long and short of it here is that there's not great evidence that uh, pharmacotherapy on its own can delay or prevent psychosis. There is some uh, support that some psychosocial interventions um, may help delay or prevent, and psychosocial interventions combined with pharmacotherapy may have an effect. But there, this is a very small literature, and the variability of um, quality of the studies is also uh, a potential source of bias here, so more work is needed. The research that's been done with clinical high-risk programs typically occur in specialty research clinics, the first of which was the Origin Youth Mental Health Program in Melbourne that was established in the mid-90s. Um, and there's been sort of development of individual uh, clinical high-risk specialty programs throughout the 90s and early 2000s around the world. Consortium started to develop uh, in the mid-2000s to try to you know, uh, combine efforts to be able to use big data strategies to identify uh, risk factors for conversion. Common elements of these programs is a convergence on clinical high risk criteria and the assessment instruments that they use. Uh, that the assessments are free, um, there's consultation and referral is, is the, the outcome of the assessment, and offering longitudinal monitoring um, of individuals identified as being at high risk. We also uh, offer rapid referral and access to care for those with, with psychosis. And having this, uh, these programs offered in a community or a non-hospital setting is preferred. Some will also offer psychosocial interventions like groups, um, case management, psychiatry services, uh, academic and occupational supports, and also integrated first episode psychosis services. 
This leads me to introducing PEER. So this is the clinical high risk program that we have developed uh, at Iowa. So PEER stands for Psychosis Risk Intervention Education and Research. And this is the program that I co-direct with Dr. Bengi Buran. The program is housed at Seashore Clinic at Stewart Hall at the University of Iowa and the Psychological and Brain Sciences Building. We offer clinical research assessments at no cost that includes a psychological and social history, gold standard assessments to evaluate symptoms, functioning, and cognitive performance, and a collection of collateral information from family and medical records. We provide feedback, uh, so we synthesize all the information and provide feedback to the individual and their family and their treatment provider regarding potential risk for psychosis. We make recommendations and referrals and also provide education about modifiable risk factors. For eligible participants, we also offer longitudinal monitoring of, a, of uh, symptoms and functioning through a study. This is a repeat assessment every few months that is also offered at no cost. And we also offer participation in a research registry and other studies. In terms of the general procedure, we use uh, screeners like, like the PQB uh, and uh, do telephone screenings once someone has been referred to our program. And then we bring someone in for a risk assessment for the peer interview. And for those who are, who are eligible, we do continue, continued monitoring through a longitudinal study. The follow-up assessments occur every three months for the first year and every six months thereafter. This is sort of an open-ended study. We're interested to learn more about long-term outcomes. So participation does not need to end at conversion for true positive cases. And we're also interested to learn more about those who are identified as being at risk but do not develop psychosis. We wanna learn what factors help to avert that negative clinical outcome. The protocol is pretty simple to get us to get us started. But if we think about potential benefits of longitudinal monitoring for the individual, we can catch psychosis early and streamline the pathway to care. For the community, we hope to reduce the duration of untreated psychosis and also provide educational opportunities for trainee clinicians. And for the field, we want to improve our understanding of risk and protective factors and long-term outcomes. In terms of how to refer for a further assessment, um, you can visit our website. So it's peer.uiowa.edu. We have a link to a referral form that you can fill out. You could also email us or give us a call if you wanna talk, talk through a referral before filling out the web form. If you're filling out a web form for, um, for a client that you're working with, we just ask that you let them know about the referral and get their permission for us to contact them. In terms of expected challenges, you know, getting the word out about the program, I would be really interested to hear back from, from the audience if you have any ideas for outreach activities so that we can spread the word. Uh, we have a website. We also uh, participate in uh, community activities like the NAMI Walk. We've also established uh, 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 connections with uh, psychiatry providers at UIHC to help uh, address the long wait times for care. And we offer training opportunities for trainee uh, clinicians and physicians. And in the future, we hope to offer evidence-based investigational treatments through our program. Future plans include community outreach and information campaigns, applying for uh, funding to support basic research and treatment studies, and to facilitate the development of a comprehensive early psychosis program at UIHC, and perhaps expand to other mental health conditions. I want to thank everyone so much for, for your attention, and I know we're, we're just about out of time. I just want to leave a couple of minutes for, uh, for questions, but if anyone wants to reach out uh, after the talk, I'm happy to chat. Thank you so much. All right, thank you so much, Dr. McCleary. Um, we did have a question that came in. Um, what are the developmental observations often made before the full development of schizophrenia? Yeah, so early, there's been um, a number of studies looking at sort of uh, what are the sort of earliest warning signs um, 
you know, oftentimes it's sort of subtle abnormalities in uh, motor skills, so fine motor development, uh, social delays, and cognitive performance are sort of the earliest warning signs. Later on, when the sort of prodromal symptoms emerge, we see sort of uh, suspiciousness, um, unusual sort of uh, perceptual experiences. So seeing shadows or movement out of the corner of the eye, hearing, hearing your name being called and so on. Those are more specific to psychosis, but much earlier on, we see these more sort of non-specific uh, motor and cognitive signs. Thank you. In terms of the, like the PQB screening tool, what providers are able to utilize that screening tool? Is that any level of provider or their training requirements or other requirements to yeah. use that screening tool? Yeah, so no, no training required. Um, so uh, the link that I provided uh, provides information about the, the scoring. And really in clinical practice, I would just, I would use this as, uh, as a way to start a conversation. So, you know, you're, you're reporting that you're experiencing these things and it's bothersome to you. Tell me more about that. Okay, thank you. And then you did receive a message from the um, a team at the Community Crisis Service Mobile uh, Crisis Response Team, and they just had put a connection in there for you to oh, great. contact with for follow up. Perfect, I will do that. All right, and then let's see. Um, maybe this is one that we might be able to answer in just this last minute here. What are the, what's the earliest age? Because I know that there were some symptoms you see even in early childhood. So just, you know, your thoughts on how early these symptoms yeah. can start. Yeah. So, you know, there's, there's childhood onset psychotic disorders. So, you know, they, they uh, those symptoms can emerge pretty early on in development for typical uh, sort of adult uh, onset schizophrenia. We see symptoms sort of emerging in early adolescence um, and late childhood. So like around 11, 12 uh, and increasing over time. Uh, the peer program uh, offers services to young people um, at age 12. 12 and up. Okay, thank you. All right, and there was a question about the evaluation. I will be sending a follow-up email with the instructions to claim credit, so be watching your email for that. And with that, we'll, I'll do a couple of announcements before we close. Um, this course was uh, certified for AMA um, PRA Category 1 credit. Attendees are able to um, claim continuing education credit by completing the evaluation and downloading their certificate. Um, again, I'll include instructions in the follow-up email on how to claim credit. Um, if you do have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me via email at kafi, K-A-F-I hyphen Dixon, D-I-X-O-N at uiowa.edu. And so I want to thank everyone again for attending and thank you, Dr. McClary, for this wonderful information. Um, I did include in the handouts, um, and I'll also include this in the follow-up email, the brochure for the peer program. So that has the, the basic information about the program. So um, thank you, everyone, and have a great afternoon. Great. Thank you so much, everyone. Take care.